Papua New Guinea is gripped by election fever. But while in most democracies elections mean a long and often tedious race, in Papua they're always a marathon. The campaign started back in March. Voting was spread over three weeks in June and July, and the final result won't be known until August. Papua New Guinea is about as close as you can get to the Stone Age. Its native tribes speak 700 different languages. Most people are uneducated and illiterate, but the ballot box is revered by all. Papua New Guineans are prepared to endure a six-month election campaign for the sake of parliamentary democracy. There can be few places where the whole concept is so utterly foreign, understood by so few, yet embraced so enthusiastically. And the recent coup in Fiji makes democracy in Papua New Guinea seem all the more precious. The country has some of the wildest terrain in the world. Communications and transport are primitive, but still, the election message gets out. People trek willingly for hours to reach the polling stations. They willingly join the long queues and willingly wear the indelible ink that brands them as voters. The reason it takes another three months to find a winner is that Papua New Guinea has a dozen parties and 1,500 candidates contesting just over 100 seats. It takes that long for workable coalitions to be reached. It was in 1975 that Papua New Guinea gained independence from Australia. Since independence, Australia has maintained a keen paternal and financial interest in Papua New Guinea's progress. Half of all Papua's imports come from its powerful neighbour. But recently there have been moves to loosen the ties with Australia and find new trading partners. The changes are thanks to this man, Pius Wingti, Papua's current Prime Minister. Wingti has forged new links with his Melanesian partners, the Solomons and Vanuatu. Michael Samari is the man Australia would like to see back in power. Known throughout the country as the chief, it was Samari who led Papua New Guinea to independence before losing control to Wingti, and he's tipped to make a comeback. With a dozen political parties and in some places 50 candidates contesting a single seat, personalities tend to be more important than issues. And ironically, personalities can become so influential that they take over from the ballot box altogether. Michael Samare is in fact the only person to have been elected Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea. Pius Wingti and Sir Julius Chan before him came to power by toppling Samare with votes of no confidence in Parliament. But while Papua New Guinea's democratic system is fraught with pitfalls of its own, there's another, more serious threat. Tribal tensions run high. The street riots of 1986 followed the death of a Highlands politician. But violence is also creeping into everyday life. Some residents have turned their homes into fortresses for fear of the rising tide of violent crime. You certainly seem to have some very elaborate security. The criminals are known, rather quaintly, as rascals. They frightened many locals into arming themselves. But a certain amount of unrest is inevitable in a country trying to rocket itself into the 20th century. And the fact is that we are trying to do in Papua New Guinea in a matter of three decades, what the Anglo-Saxons took literally centuries to do, Papua New Guinea is trying to do in 30 years. In that situation, you've got to have problems. You've got to have social transitions. You've got to have culture shock. 
You mean we're going to be asleep for five years? Correct. Oh, well, do you mind if we slip into something a little more comfortable? It's the culture shock of a primitive society suddenly getting nightly doses of American sitcoms. Papua New Guinea has entered the television age thanks to Australian media moguls. And Papua New Guineans are now getting their first taste of the commercial hard sell. The 20th century has arrived with a bang and a jingle. It's no wonder if sometimes the natives look confused. The voters of Papua New Guinea know their country is changing. The new leader's greatest challenge will be to mobilize the nation's vast human and mineral resources so that Papua New Guinea can join the developed world on an equal footing. For the time being, Papua New Guinea gazes out in wonder while the rest of the world looks on in interest.